When the best players from England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland embarked on their tour to New Zealand in 1930, they carried with them the hopes of a British public eager to reassert their rugby dominance over the colonial outpost. But the Lions quickly came to realise that rugby in New Zealand was much more than just a game. It mirrored a way of life. We then were very much amateur in the way we played, you know, it was fun. But we, when we got to New Zealand, they played a much harder type of game. Not dirty, but hard. Not they an enormous pack, but one all, all bone and muscle. And they knew how to use it. But we were like little schoolboys. The Lions may not have had the physical presence of their all-black counterparts, but they were a skillful team and surprisingly upset the home side in the first test. The All Blacks, however, won the next two, and before a record crowd at Athletic Park, they ran away with a final test, 22 points to eight, scoring six tries to one. But the results on the pitch seemed to matter little to the Lions. They were very much um, gentlemen from an amateur era, and you know, three months away from home was, was a good a good trip for the boys, and, and the rugby was sort of the reason for the trip, but not the sole purpose of the trip. In fact, for some of the players, the highlight of the tour was the New Zealanders' more than generous hospitality. Off the pitch was uh, as good as you one might expect. You can't say this on, on the, this thing, but uh, the New Zealanders were so happy with our coming that they'd lend you their women folk quite openly and yeah, you, you'd have enjoyed it. By 1950, New Zealand's physical and uncompromising attitude to the game was well known. But the home union seemed determined to persevere with a more gentlemanly approach. I wouldn't believe this. We had Ray Cale here, who, was, who ultimately turned league because he was so disappointed by not being selected on this tour. He was an outstanding flank forward. And do you know the reason why they wouldn't take him? He was too rough. Now, can you imagine that? The 1950 Lions proved to be extremely popular tourists during their three-month tour through a country seemingly in no hurry to embrace the modern world. Well, they were a bit behind the times, that's right, about 50 years, I think. <laughs> it's quite a little bit different to this country then. In this country, you know, the pubs are the pubs. But in, in New Zealand, men get to the pubs in about five minutes, they drink about five pints because the pubs close then. <laughs> On the rugby field, the Lions proved more than a match for the All Black backs, and only superior forward play gave New Zealand an edge heading into the third test. Athletic Park Wellington and the British Isles and the New Zealand Rugby Union teams take the field for the third of four tests. With the first game drawn and the second won by New Zealand, this may be the vital match of the rubber. The third test is remembered not for the outstanding rugby, but for the heroics of all-black captain Ron Elvidge, who suffered horrific injuries in this tackle by Jackie Matthews. It was a fair tackle. Uh, um, Ron Elvidge was captain of the all-blacks in this test, and he had the ball, and I knew I left the ground, hit him, and I didn't realise, but apparently I fractured his sternum. Elvidge also sustained a gash to his forehead. With no replacements allowed, these were desperate times for the all-blacks. With stitches in his head and suffering severe pain, the New Zealand skipper made his way back onto the field and into New Zealand rugby folklore. And Elvid races for the line and crashes over in a tackle. A gallant effort by New Zealand's captain, who just returned to the field after having four stitches put in his body. Elvidge's courageous try had sealed the series for the home side. The New Zealand captain never played for the All Blacks again. When the 1959 Lions arrived, parts of New Zealand society were doing their best to keep in time with the rest of the world. Elvis was about to be king, but in most parts of New Zealand, rugby still ruled. The tiny village of Culverton is last stop for the visitors before they reach the west coast proper, and the people turn out in force to say hello. Enthusiasm for rugby is a national characteristic, and one that shows itself at a very early age. People looked forward to their Lions match, even if it was, you know, 
lions against Buller West Coast combined and Greymouth or something. The, it involved and involved everyone and, and I think in those days people who followed rugby could name the whole Lions team and they could they could name you know the midweek teams and they were all sort of almost as familiar as as the local players. New Zealand's enthusiasm for the game of rugby was no greater than at this time and huge crowds turned out for all games. Incredibly one in every three New Zealanders saw the Lions play in 1959. The tourists popularity was helped greatly by their open and enterprising approach to the game. The quality of the of the Lions backs, you know, guys like Tony O'Reilly, for example, uh, were, were far and away better than, than the New Zealand backs. Um, but they got done up front. And they got done by the man they called the boot. Don Clark kicked an incredible six penalty goals in the first test, single-handedly winning the game, 18 points to 17. His heroics continued in the second when he dived over for the match-winning try in the dying seconds. And in the third, his sublime all-round skills were no better illustrated than with this left-footed drop goal. Of the 57 points scored by the All Blacks in this series, Clark scored 39 of them. The tourists did record a deserved and popular victory in the fourth test, but by then the All Blacks had already wrapped up the series. The thing is about the whole history of British Lions to, to New Zealand, you have to hand it to us because we would come down, we'd go all over the country, we'd entertain you with brilliant back play and always lose. Once again, the entertainers from the Northern Hemisphere left these shores, heroic losers. If the four home unions had learned anything from past failings and tours to New Zealand, it wasn't evident in the selection of the Lions team in 1966. The 66 Lions tour, I think, was every mistake the Lions ever made kind of all rolled into one, like being uh, afraid of actually doing it properly. I think they appointed a coach, but they wouldn't let him coach. Appointing a military man, and, and a, I'm sure he was a thoroughly decent chap, Mike campbell Hamilton as the captain, but he was never ever up to it, the poor bloke, as a player or as a leader. Major campbell Lamerton was certainly affable enough, but the way he reacted to his appointment as Lions captain hardly put the fear of God into the New Zealand rugby public. They sent a couple of emissaries down to tell him that he'd been made the captain of the British Lions. And I remember it was well reported that it said he broke down and wept at, you know, well, pretty good. But I think it kind of caused a wry chuckle through this country because I thought, well, come on in. And eagerly waiting for the Lions was a battle-hardened New Zealand side, featuring some of the legendary names of all black rugby. And the New Zealand Rugby Union was also making life difficult for the tourists. I was a substitute for the first test and I remember the New Zealand Rugby Union, they sent us to Queenstown to train <laughs> before the first test. Now this is midwinter in New Zealand and they sent us to Queenstown to train for the first test for, I, I can't remember now, three or four days. And we went up there because it's frozen, solid, midwinter. And I, we couldn't run, there was nowhere to train. And we ended up at the airfield where, where there were grass runways. And you could run on it reasonably well. And we ended up there trying to run and prepare for the first test. And, you know, we, we would be out there doing something. And then somebody would shout, aeroplane, aeroplane. And we'd all run like hell and hide in behind the hangar until the aeroplane came in. And then we would sneak out again. It was absolutely hilarious. The New Zealand Rugby Union need not have bothered making things tough for the Lions. On the field, the All Blacks had things well in control. New Zealand, Tremaine, Smith, Colin Lee. Nathan. Smith. The All Blacks were rampant, and the 1966 Lions failed to win a solitary test. And I think that team just, um, you know, I think they should have stayed on the plane.
Four times the Lions had toured New Zealand. Four times they'd been beaten. But in 1971, they were determined things would be different. The team arrived to much fanfare, but the New Zealand public still had no reason to believe that history would not again repeat itself. But it was soon obvious that even for a team that had always been known for having outstanding backs, the 71 Lions were something special. Williams, Bourbon. In 1971, I had a backline. I, 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 as a forward, I had the privilege of playing with a backline of, of Gareth Edwards, Barry John, Mike Gibson, John Dawes, David Duckham, Gerald Davis, and J.P.R. Williams. And I keep saying, if it's better than that today, it must be very good. Just as significantly, the 1971 Lions had a forward pack that was willing to meet fire with fire. Before the first test, the Lions played Canterbury in a match that is well remembered, but not for the rugby. The Lions blamed us, we blamed the Lions. It's just one of those things that blew up. And um, they didn't back off. The Lions had signalled their intentions, but paid a heavy price. Front row forward Sandy Carmichael suffered a fractured cheekbone and was invalided out of the tour. Fellow prop Ray McLaughlin's tour was also ended, although his hand injury was said to be the result of ill-advised retaliatory action. McLaughlin is an intelligent man. He's a front row player, but he's an intelligent man. He hit Alec Wiley on the head. He broke his thumb. And you don't, you don't hit people like Alec Wiley on, on the head. <laughs> Despite the Lions' promising early tour form, few New Zealanders saw them as a major threat when the first test kicked off in Dunedin. Along with the New Zealand public, I was totally confident that had some very good wins leading up to the first test in Dunedin. But I was totally confident that these upstarts were going to really get a taste of what All Black Rugby was capable of dishing out. The New Zealand rugby public was about to get a nasty shock. Barry John, John Dawes, that's the big man, that's John Durbin. Number eight for the Christ, and look at this try, it's a try for the Lions, both best, and go forward, Ian McLaughlin. Despite the early Lions try, it was in fact the All Blacks who dominated much of the game but a brace of forward play that had served New Zealand rugby so well for generations was no longer enough. We just hammered and hammered, particularly in the first half, and uh, we, just, we just couldn't score, and it just gave them, gave them a bit of hope, and uh, they hung in there and beat us 9-3. I mean, there was not much in it, but it's what matters at the end, isn't it? The Lions' success owed much to the mercurial talents of Barry John. New Zealand or World Rugby had never witnessed such tactical and goal-kicking genius. Really, that was why we beat the All Blacks, by kicking the ball, not by running the ball. But we certainly didn't feel dominant. And as I say, I, I remember coming off the field and thinking, did we win? Did, did we score four points in the All Blacks? It was amazing, but it was a hell of a game. New Zealand scored within five minutes of the second test and went on to win by a comfortable margin. This game, though, will always be remembered for two of the greatest tries ever scored in the history of this famous rivalry. Williams, out in front, midway 25 from goal line. Open field, outside the 25. He's got Gibson outside him. Davies, way down here, outside the 25, inside the 25, and they're running the ball for the try. If the Lions' try owed much to sublime backline teamwork, the All Blacks' try owed everything to individual brilliance. And that just came out of nowhere. I mean, that's what happens in the game, I suppose. It's just things happen and instinctively you do something. And uh, But it was really the... Um, the points that, that mattered, not, not how we got them in the event, I suppose, what we won fairly comfortably, but yeah, it was one of those things that happens and uh, you, <laughs> you put it behind you and you move on. Pity it didn't, uh, didn't happen in the third test. 
With the series tied up one apiece, many in New Zealand felt the All Blacks would prove too strong in the third. Again, they would be proved wrong. A rampant Lions side completely ambushed the home team. Within 20 minutes, they had jumped to a 13-point lead. The All Blacks never recovered. After 40 years of trying, there were only one test win or draw away from creating history. Playing to salvage the series, the All Blacks started strongly. In the early stages of the game, Sid going, number eight forward Wiley, the dummy, beautiful piece of work that, this could be a try but a great tackle that will snap up a try for Cottrell. But this was a lion's side like no other, and when individual brilliance was needed, there was no shortage of providers. Gareth Edwards waiting for this one, Duckham flinging it out. John Williams, the fullback. Oh, he turned well, and he did it. John Williams' 50-metre drop goal was his first in international rugby. As always, his timing was perfect. The Lions had held on for a 14-all draw, and the series was theirs by two tests to one. It was the greatest team, the <coughs> greatest touring team that I'd ever seen come here, and that would include South Africans, Australians, um, a anyone else. But to me, they would be the they would be the yardstick that I judged all other teams uh, forever after. For me, having been on the previous ones. To beat in New Zealand and to win, uh, that, was, that was special. That's something that I'll treasure. To say, right, I've gone to New Zealand and we've beaten them in New Zealand. Uh, uh, that's something I'll treasure. After beating the All Blacks in 71, the 74 Lions then did the same against South Africa. British rugby was on a high, and it was a confident Lions side that landed in New Zealand in 1977. But the team's captain was a reluctant tourist. I, I was picked as captain, and really, I must be perfectly honest, I didn't know up until about two or three months before the tour went, or two months possibly, whether I was going to come to New Zealand as a tourist, leave alone as a captain, because uh, I, I'd been touring since 1968 with the Welsh team as a young kid out to Argentina, then I'd come to New Zealand in 69. So I'd been away most summers, never been home, you know. And it was very important for me in 77, I, I had a two-year-old little boy, nearly two years of age, and um, my family, Pat and I, had lost a little boy in 1974, a young child, and that absolutely d destroyed us for a long time. So when the new little boy came along, he was so precious, you know, I didn't want to leave him for a second. Just a few metres to go to the line. Williams away to Bennett. Despite his reservations, the captain decided to lead the Lions down under. It would be a decision he'd later come to regret. For a start, there was the weather. The Lions had to endure one of the worst New Zealand winters on record. Hardly conducive conditions for enterprising rugby or enjoyable touring. You talk to those players today and I'm sure that would be, you know, the, one of the uppermost memories that they have of, of just such a wet, a wet winter. All I remember is four months of uh, wet weekends and uh, spending a lot of time in pool halls on Sunday afternoons with nothing else, there, nowhere else to go. Someone had forgotten to turn the hot water on in the Lions' changing room after their first match against Wairarapa Bush. It was perhaps symbolic of the rather cool reception the Lions received by parts of the local media and public. Well, when we arrived, maybe in Auckland, wherever it was, within days, people were saying to us, we are going to stuff you, because we can't forget what you did in 1972 when we were out there touring. And I was saying, well, what was that? Well, you got Keith Murdoch sent home, you know, a bit of a scuffle, and, and, and Clarethi, your club, beat the All Blacks and the Barbaria. I said, well, yeah, OK, yeah. And then I think you'd gone to South Africa in between that period and got beaten out in South Africa. So I think the New Zealand public wanted revenge. And really, I felt, felt a difference. There were many thousands of magnificent people up there. But I honestly felt there was an edge to it, if you like, that 
This was win at all costs. The New Zealand public's intensity was carried onto the field by the All Blacks in the first test. And the locals scored early. Cobner, Duggan out there quickly. Bill Osmond. Batty. That's only 10 metres out. Going. A brilliant try for Sid going. But the vital moment of the game occurred when a virtual certain try to the Lions was turned into a six-pointer for the All Blacks. So too, Graham Price. Brynmer Williams can run here. Brian Williams not sure who to take. Steve Fenwick. Trevor Evans, there's a line-up out to the right. Batty! Intercept! The little ginger fella. <laughs> the bane of many Welshmen and British Lions, Grant Batty. That was a soul destroyer. And I think that maybe set the tone for, for the Test Series, you know, because if you can win your first Test away from home, you're one up and your confidence is growing. After that, we made a lot of changes for the second Test. So that you, you're right, that possible one try was, was huge in, in the whole Test Series. Despite the first test four, setback, Lions the Lions were far from done and came storming back in the second. Andy Hayden going across in cover was at Kirkpatrick. Farrell left it behind. 13 is Jack Ray. Gordon Brown outside the 22. Cornell, McGeekin, JJ Williams. What a score! And here they come. The tables were now turned and a nervous New Zealand public could sense a repeat of 71. National pride was at stake, and the game's importance was not lost on one of the All Black veterans. It was do or die for a series. I mean, if we had lost that game, the series, winning the series was, was gone. So we knew we had, to, we had to win that way. There was a big one for us here, for all of us. Kikuki stood up and uh, made one of those off the cuff and from the heart speeches, which, uh, resonates with you when you're, when you're looking for leadership and uh, direction and those sort of moments and you know being the man he was I'm, I'm, it all helps bearing in mind that when you're preparing for a test match you very much live in your own world and uh, but I can certainly remember Kirky was very very steamed up for that test. Number 11 Brian Ford makes the first throw in in test rugby Brian Ford got a loose ball 22 metres line Lynn Davis back in Test Rugby. Doug Bruce, the All Blacks are running it. Bruce Robertson with Bevan Wilson ranging up. That's the goal line. It must be an early try. It is. What a sensational start. And Ian Kirkpatrick was the man that got it. John McEldowney, Bush and Tani Norton. Laurie Knight. Free to Lynn Davis. Away to Doug Bruce. Running. Bruce Robertson. Brian Ford. Bircher made the tackle, look at Ford's strength, that's the goal line. Hayden, what does Dave Miller say? Try! Palm down to Morgan, Bennett chases Murray. Down goes Bennett. Bill Osmond made it. Kicking through again to halfway, Osmond in the play again. Irvin, the All Blacks are rapid, Kirkpatrick's dribbling it. Field to his clubmate Laurie Knight. Just 10 metres more to go. Ford's in the move. Davis swinging it out to Bruce Robinson. A line up, a drop kick, a goal. The match is over. 19 points to seven. The Lions' management were never overly popular, and with any chance of winning the series gone, they chose to further distance themselves from the public and media. Really, we were all a bit naive, you know. Instead of going and enjoying the hospitality of New Zealand, instead of going out and really meeting the people, we became uh, a little bit insular. We became, uh, I don't know, stubborn, if you like. And sometimes we wouldn't let open ourselves out to the public and to, to the press. And there was this sort of, it's us against them, and you can never beat the press. Regardless of the mistakes made by the management, there's no doubt the 77 Lions was subjected to a barrage of gutter journalism. Truth magazine or Truth newspaper, one thing it isn't is 
lives up to its title. But uh, there was all sorts of you know um, stories about trying to put girls here, there, and everywhere. So you know it, it's pretty tough when you're away from home, and, and these stories come out, and you you know you've got family back home, and uh, you, you've got less than scrupulous journalists who are trying to concoct all different stories. And, Eden Park was the venue for the final test. Ironically, the weather was gloriously fine. New Zealand had not defeated the Lions or South Africa in a series for over a decade. The public demanded an all-black win. But it was the Lions who struck first. This is Bill Beaumont. Infield the Graham Price, Steve Fenwick, five metres out. Doug Morgan! Ahead on the scoreboard, the Lions were also completely dominant at scrum time, continuously embarrassing the all-black pack. The problem was further compounded when all-black prop John McEldowney retired injured. Yeah, John McEldowney actually left the field and there was a scrum, so we were a prop short. I mean, they didn't bring them on as quick then as they do now. And so just this all happened very quickly. Tony Norton turned around to me and he said, you go into prop, and I said, you go and get lost. I said, pointing at Frank Oliver, put him in there. And before Frank could sort of say yes or no, Laurie Knight came along and put his hand up. Lifting a lot of weights in Gisborne, I thought I was a strong guy. I thought I'd go to the front row and be tight head against Cotton. And uh, so I remember when the weight came on in the first scrum and uh, my back just went the wrong way. And uh, it was quite a frightening experience. And uh, I tried all sorts of things. Cotton really didn't know I was there. He just flicked me around and did what he wanted to. Knight's international propping career was mercifully short-lived when substitute prop Billy Bush was finally cleared to take the field. But with time almost up on the clock, the All Blacks still trailed by nine points to six. Laurie Knight may have had little impact in the front row, but his impact on the outcome of the series was about to be massive. To this day, I, I, I can't look at the video because it's probably the biggest disappointment in, in my rugby life, if you like, that has summed up this tour for me. And I think in all honesty, I've been lucky to have many, many highs in rugby and a lot of lows, but that minute, that 30 seconds when he scored the try and when the whistle went, 3-1 down instead of certainly to all, and we, we could have easily have won the series. That would be my worst moment in rugby union football and that you know, when you think you've been away and you've worked so hard in many ways uh, and you get nothing out of it. And at the end of the day, you can say, oh yeah, it was an, somebody dropped the ball. But the record books will always say, New Zealand won the series 3-1. Lions teams have often struggled with travelling to New Zealand, experiencing a form of culture shock. This was certainly the case in 1983, not only for the players, but for some of the press as well. I, was, I remember that the, the, the first day I ever landed in New Zealand for the 83 tour, it was two days before the first test match at Lancaster Park. And on that day, the Canterbury Rugby Supporters Club had a, uh, a gathering. And I'd never been to New Zealand before. And, and I, I walked in and there was just a great mass of blokes, not a single woman, and they were all drinking this cold, rather weak beer out of what they call pitchers. And, you know, we just have pints and, and the, you have to pour it. And there were three of us standing there. I always remember this guy with a little, uh, a little cap on saying, Oi, come here. And I thought he was unbelievably rude, so I ignored him. He said, You, come here. And he said, uh, Sit there. And he said, There we go. He said, Get the piss down you. And I thought, oh, God, This is the rudest look I've ever met. But actually we got talking and I realised that was him being welcoming. As well as the odd case of culture shock, there were some selection issues. Skipper Karen Fitzgerald was not considered the best player in his position by the press or even by members of his own team. Well there were two hookers uh, who were, were the, the, the top hookers really at that time in the UK. There was Colin Deans who went and got the number two spot and, and Peter Wheeler. Um, who, why he didn't go I, I will never know. Um, Kieran Fitzgerald got it because he'd been successful with the Irish side that year um, and got on the strength of that. Um, who knows? I don't know what, what went on in selection there. 
big jump by Witt. The 83 Lions also came up against a strong, well-oiled All Black side that was expected to completely dominate the series. But the first test proved a far more even contest than most experts had predicted. Hobbs, Shaw, Bukhetti, Hewson, Fraser. Shaw, and wait a minute, it's a try. Despite this Mark Shaw try, the game was still in the balance with time almost up on the clock. The enigmatic Alan Hewson then put the match beyond doubt. His skill level was was um, a lot higher than anybody else around, and when it counted, he was there. I mean, he was a wonderful attacking player, um, sound under the high ball when nobody else was too close to him, and uh, when he was under a bit of pressure, I think most people knew that you had to go back and give him a hand. But on attack, none better. The second test saw the All Black forwards completely dominate. Yet they managed to score just one try in a comfortable, but not completely convincing, 9-0 victory. The third test was played in atrocious conditions, and again the All Blacks looked comfortable, but not completely dominant. The question everyone was asking before the fourth test was whether the All Blacks could finally put everything together. I was very confident we were going to win, and you don't often go into a test feeling that way. So I think the confidence levels have built up and perhaps um, my recollection is that we, we had to talk on the Friday about being too confident uh, and not taking them too easily. As it turned out, it was one of those games you, uh, you live for because just everything turned right for us on the day. It was, was a, a fantastic game to be part of. Leverage wants it up. Here it is. All right, it done. Again, Warwick Taylor left out. Fraser in. Wilson. Here it comes. For Stuart Wilson. Wilson plays half back Taylor. Pocari kicking for Wilson. Here comes another one for the flying Stu Wilson. And it is. Pocari. Wilson. Houston up. Campbell covering. Oh, Houston's in. Alan Houston's in. Under the posts. Like their 1966 the counterparts. The 83 Lions suffered the humiliation of a 4-0 series whitewash. A decade after the 83 humiliation, the Lions again arrived down under and were quick to show the locals that this was a side containing some players of genuine class. Tapuni throws hard and low, Jones under pressure, got it away nicely to Barnes, now Gus gone, here comes the fullback, Clement, he's in, looks inside, Barnes on the burst, the Lions have a chance, Gus got it. While quick to hit their straps on the field, adjusting to New Zealand conditions off the field was proving a tad more difficult. And this is not the fault of, of, of New Zealand, but when you go to some places, you know, compared to the standard of hotel and stuff like that that you get, they must get when they come over here. You know, some of the places are, you know, like motorings and uh, there's a backpacker's hostel in Vaughan. I, I walked in and he said, all you can eat for 4 95 I said, where the fuck are we? Southland was the final provincial game before the first test match. It was a comfortable enough victory for the Lions, but once again, life in the provinces was not to everyone's liking. One of the difficulties is that you go on Lions to you have 13 weeks in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a foreign country, a beautiful country, you know, I witnessed Lord of the Rings, and you don't see any of it. You know, you see a lot of airports, you see Invercargill, which I think is twinned with Chernobyl, um, or should be. Um, or Bhopal or whatever, really. And, um, you know, you go down there and they say to you, uh, do you like our oysters, mate? And they say, no, I don't like oysters. And that's the end of the conversation, really. British Lions led by Captain Gavin Hastings. The first test was held at Christchurch's Lancaster Park. 
and despite the Lions supporters doing their best to be heard, it was the home side who struck first. Good strong play by the All Black skipper. Here they come again, Fox. Again pumps the kick high in behind them. Now a real scramble on here. And let's have a look. Yes, try. Frank Bunce. But in a whistle-ridden match, Gavin Hastings' reliable boot kicked six penalties. With just seconds remaining, the Lions held a slender one-point lead. Australian referee Mr Kinsey then awarded a controversial last-minute penalty to the All Blacks. To this day, the penalty is hotly disputed by all Lions supporters. Suspect try in the first few minutes and a dodgy refereeing decision in the last minute. Um, we felt pretty hard done by, I must admit. Uh, I thought we played well that day and, and it was a good test match. Uh, but, you know, when Dean Richards was penalised in that last minute, I knew there was only one place the ball was going once Grant Fox, Grant Fox put it on the floor. Time is virtually up on the clock. Grant Fox can win the test match with this kick. Toms are meant to be the world champion winners, but the first test match of that tour definitely included the most horrific refereeing decision I've ever seen in my life. After the dramatic first test loss, things went from bad to worse for the tourists. First losing to Auckland, and then dropping the midweek game to Hawke's Bay. The Lions were in danger of falling apart. You know, from my perspective, I think you look back on that tour and you know, I had nothing to do with the original selection, but you just look back at that and just realise that there were some guys that just didn't front up. And I'm afraid that far too many, certainly the midweek team, the 93 tour, just copped out and they went on the piss. And you know, it's out of order. It was out of order. It was unforgivable. unforgivable. Lack of form and dissension in the ranks was bad enough, but the Lions also had to contemplate going into the second test without their inspirational leader. It was a shambles. The whole preparation was a complete and utter shambles. I remember going to Geech um, the Friday, the day before, and I said, I can't play, my hamstring's not right. And he said, I don't care if you're on for five seconds, you're leading the team out into the field. And that was a pretty strong endorsement uh, from, from the coach. And, uh, you know, so I kind of didn't know what to expect. While the captain was apprehensive, Injuries and lack of form meant that a young replacement lock by the name of Martin Johnson was about to be thrown into the test arena. I think a few of the lads were sort of weren't too sure really what to expect and suddenly as soon as you go within a week you realise that he was, he was going to be the main man then. Um, I mean he was big and athletic yet he was, you know, he was a tough, tough guy and he might have only been 22 at the time but you know, he was the man it seemed quite obvious he was the man you needed to, to take on you know, the All Blacks. Johnson's inclusion helped the Lions dominate the forward exchanges, especially in the lineouts. But the game was still in the balance halfway through the second half, before the All Black captain made an uncharacteristic and costly mistake. Now the All Blacks, the head just popping up there, having a look. Oh, knock on, the All Blacks have lost it. Gascott, now Underwood, he's a man, he's a flyer. While the Lions fans went into wild celebration, one of their forwards also decided it was time to toast his side's impending victory. I remember going back to the halfway line and waving to the crowd nicely and uh, cans rained down from the crowd, and including one that landed near me actually, it was full. Now I don't know why I did this, but I, so I, I opened it and I drank it and threw it away, you know. Um, to waved and that was just a upset everyone more. And then they went down, really on the scrum, people said, to be drinking around here, so it's just not, not usual for a, for a test match. The final whistle allowed the thirsty hooker another celebratory drink, whilst his opposite was left to contemplate his own mistake and the prospect of a series loss. Inherently, I sort of look at the, the bad things rather than the good things, and uh, for me, if people said, you know, which test match do you remember the most? And I said, well, the one, one I lost, the 1993 test against the Lions in Wellington. I always remember saying to, or speaking to Sean after the game and he said, just watch out, watch the press. We're going to you know, get two days of absolute shit in the press. And uh, he was right. 
And I remember him coming to the press conference afterwards and, you know, if ever a man looked utterly gutted and you, you could see every word, he, he, he forced out some sort of tribute to the Lions, well done for the Lions, and tried to smile. But you could see even then, in typical Fitzpatrick fashion, his mind had totally obliterated the, the game and was already looking forward to three o'clock or whatever it was in, in Auckland the, the week after. Joseph taking it, Stensness up to Penny. Really soft tackles there from the Lions. Joseph meets a big one though through Papa Will who just stands off later. Now quick ball, flat there, Stensness, that's what he's there for. The kick for Bunce, what sort of bounce? It's a great bounce! From Winterbottom, winning it once more. Hoping someone was there, and there was. This is building up stuff from the All Blacks now. Joseph, they must score here, do they, through Fitzpatrick? Yes! Well, if they really want to nail it and win a Test Series, they've got to do it around this time. Here's the chance. Great attacking chance again. They need a big scrum. They have a big scrum. After the despair of the week before, the All Black side had completed one of the most remarkable turnarounds. And once more, the Lions were left to contemplate what might have been. There's only one British Lions side that's ever gone down there and won a Test Series. And there's probably been a couple of close and, and heroic failures. Well, you know, you don't get anything for coming second, and, and we didn't. But, um, you know, in New Zealand 93, we, were, we weren't far away from winning a Test Series. And, uh, you know, we've possibly got an Australian referee to thank for that. <laughs> Bloody Aussies. <laughs> now in 2005, the All Blacks and the Lions are set to rekindle one of world rugby's most famous and enduring rivalries. Once again, New Zealand is about to play host to the mighty pride. To me, the Lions are at everything because that's ultimately when you look at all the legends and all the stories the majority of them come from the Lions. I happen to think that not even the World Cup is bigger than a British Lions tour, it's the pinnacle. It always was from history and amazingly through the ravages of professionalism coming in, the game changing etc, I think the Lions is still, is still supreme. Yeah, there's no doubt that me looking back at my career now that the Lions was, was unquestionably, um, you know, a massive, massive honour and, and way up there with the highlights of, of my career and, and I hope anyone else's because, you know, the Lions is, is big news and uh, you're about to find out just how big it will be.
New Zealand. Lines captain unsure what to expect. Other injuries and lack of form meant that a young replacement lock by the name of Black side had made one of the most remarkable turnarounds, and once more the Lions were left to contemplate what might have been.